Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Settling in Saskatchewan, Sponsoring Refugees and Displaced Persons in Your Community. I'm Stephanie, and I'm the Education and Events Coordinator with SUMA. And thank you for joining us for this express webinar today on how you can welcome individuals or families who've been forcibly displaced from their home to your community. Today, we'll be hearing from Corinne Prince, G Director General of Settlement, Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada, Doug Rain, Director, Programs and Partnerships, and Shelley Kilbride, Director, Economic Immigration, both from the Ministry of Immigration and Career Training with the Government of Saskatchewan, Danilo Puderak, Executive Director of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress of Saskatchewan, and Ahmed Majid, Executive Director of Saskatchewan Association of Immigrant Settlement and Integration Agencies. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentations today. Please enter your questions into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar and the presenters will address as many questions as we have time for at the end. Please keep in mind, presenters cannot answer any questions related to specific settlement cases. Information for who to contact for questions regarding specific cases will be included in the chat. Moderating today's webinar will be April Phillips from SUMA's Board of Directors. April is the Director for the Northeast Region. Thank you all for attending today. Be sure to keep an eye out on the municipal update and member emails for future webinar opportunities. Our next web webinar is on monetizing your organic waste, generating revenue with scope three carbon emissions. It will be on Tuesday, May 31st at 10 o'clock a.m. And the link to, of today's recording will be sent out to all registrants in the next few days with the link to register for that webinar included in that email. As you all know, SUMA uses Zoom. All of the icons should be along the bottom of your screen. Audio settings are in the bottom left corner, and if you're having any problems with audio on your computer, you can use this setting to switch to phone audio. Once the presenters have finished their presentations today, there will be the opportunity to ask questions. Please use the Q&A feature to ask questions that you have and take a look at the others' questions that have been submitted. You can click the thumbs up feature next to the question to upvote it so that it gets to the top of the list. Please avoid using the chat pod to submit questions as they may get missed, but we do have staff keeping an eye on them to move them over to the Q&A as well. I would like to thank our Webform, webinar platform sponsor, Sumasure. Sumasure is your trusted insurance partner, providing the best property and liability coverage to Saskatchewan municipalities. Thanks to Sumasure's sponsorship, all SUMA webinars are now free to all members. Please remember to any, answer any questions that you have during the presentation into the Q&A box, and we will ask as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Now that we have all of that housekeeping out of the way, I'd like it to pass it over to April Phillips to start us off. Thank you, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone. I'm April Phillips, Director for the Northeast Region for SUMA. Um, we have a very busy uh, packed hour here coming up, so let's get right to it. Um, our first presenter this morning is Corinne Prince with Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada, or IRCC. Corinne has been with IRCC since 2008 and has held various directorial positions with the organization in that time. In the early fall of 2021, during Canada's tremendous effort to resettle 40,000 Afghan refugees, Corinne was named Director General of the Afghanistan Settlement Branch with the mandate to lead in Canada settlement activities for Afghan refugees by bringing together national resettlement operations and policy into a single integrated organization. Corinne grew up in northern Saskatchewan and now makes her home in the Ottawa Valley in Ontario with her two children and her partner. Welcome, Corinne. Thank you so much, April. Uh, bonjour, bon matin à tout le monde. Uh, I am really excited to be with you today. Um, as April said, I, I did grow up in northern Saskatchewan, a, a small community, uh, Delmas, Saskatchewan, and my grandfather actually was the mayor of Painton. And so I remember as a child hearing this term SUMA and uh, he was, uh, was a member of your organization. So it's um, uh, a very, um, very great uh, opportunity for me to be with you today. Uh, I'm really pleased to join you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Ashabeg people uh, here in Ottawa. 
We could go to slide two, please. <clears throat> So why Ukraine and why now? Um, well, as you all know, uh, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by uh, Russian forces has disrupted the livelihood of the people living in Ukraine, sparking concerns for their safety, for their family members and their friends around the world. And since February 24th, uh, approximately 6.2 million people have fled Ukraine most of whom have gone to European Union member states, with Poland accepting the majority of those who have left. Um, a number of Ukrainians remain in the country, um, with an estimated 7.7 .7 million have been internally displaced, having fled their homes. We go to slide three, please. So, um, when the war began, um, Canada um, wanted to determine um, how to most quickly um, offer safe passage to Canada. And uh, so in response to that, um, my department, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, introduced the Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency Travel. You may hear this described as a SUAT visa. Uh, and along with that, a number of other uh, measures, uh, including uh, prioritization of, of uh, all uh, Ukrainians holding Canadian passports and travel documents, uh, anyone requiring citizenship proofs, permanent resident, temporary resident visas, student and work visas. So anybody who was actually already in Canada on a work visa or a student visa um, but it was coming to an end. We obviously did not want them to have to return to Ukraine. So all of those visas were extended automatically to allow them to stay in Canada if they were already here. And the, this new SUET visa uh, was, was launched on March 17th to enable anyone in Ukraine or in uh, Eastern Europe to apply to come to Canada uh, with their families. We move to slide four, please. So as I said, um, this, this temporary visa was the fastest way to, uh, to bring them here. Um, uh, all of the um, fees for the visa were waived. So this is uh, absolutely uh, free of uh, charge. Um, it uh, basically uh, allows uh, Ukrainians and their family members to uh, enter Canada um, uh, for up to 10 years. Uh, and uh, it comes with a free uh, three-year open work permit. So they can work for any companies um, without having to apply for a uh, special dispensation to change employers. So um, they can move from employer to employer for up to three years. And they can also use the visa to study. So if they are um, you know, maybe perhaps uh, a student age or, um, uh, or wanting to um, requalify uh, for a skill, uh, skilled trade or an occupation, they can use this visa as a study uh, visa as well. Um, there is no cap on the number of visas uh, we are uh, handing out because this is uh, um, a basically a visitor visa. And in the immigration program, we do not cap visitors. Um, uh, as many visitors that apply and are eligible to come to Canada are able to come in any given year. We'll move to slide five, please. Um, so Suma asked me to just give you a bit of an outline about the various immigration streams. This is sort of an immigration 101. So as I said, there are two main pathways for people to come to Canada. The first is um, uh, as a temporary resident. So either um, this is for visitors, uh, international students, and temporary foreign workers. And so you uh, have likely seen students in the province or in your community, potentially even temporary foreign workers, uh, and of course, visitors. The second stream is for permanent residents. And under that stream, we have a number of categories. 
um, you can apply to come in via an economic stream. So those are usually higher skilled individuals um, and also include those coming in through the provincial nominee program. So the province of Saskatchewan has a provincial nominee program, which comes in under an economic stream. The second stream is, um, is a, a family stream. Family reunification is still a priority for, for the government. Um, and it allows for families to sponsor spouses, children, parents, grandparents. Uh, often people coming to live in Canada want to bring their loved ones with them. And finally, uh, the third component of the permanent stream is for resettled refugees and protected persons. And so you've heard a lot lately about um, Canada's commitment to 40,000 Afghan refugees. So all of those Afghan refugees will be coming in under this permanent resident uh, refugee stream. Next slide, please. So let's go back to the Ukrainian uh, nationals that are arriving. So on this special temporary SUAT visa, which was launched on March 17th, between uh, March 17th and, and May the 4th, we have received over 220,000 applications for Ukrainians and their de dependents under this stream. And of those, our department has already approved uh, more than 104,000 of those applications. So it doesn't mean that all of those people have yet arrived. They are, they are approved to come whenever they're ready. Uh, and they may want to stay a little longer in Ukraine because as you know, anyone, any males between the age of 18 and 60 are required to stay to help fight the war in Ukraine. So it's a, it's a difficult situation for them and, and they're making some very tough decisions, um, but Canada uh, has opened their arms to Ukrainians. So um, we know from our colleagues at Canada Border Services Agency that uh, since uh, January, over 22,000 Ukrainians have landed in Canada, either uh, at our land borders or at, um, at airports uh, in Canada. And we have, um, uh, since uh, March the 30th, contracted with the Canadian Red Cross to have an airport reception service in place uh, in uh, Vancouver, in Edmonton, and uh, at, in Toronto. Um, those are the, some of the, th the three um, largest ports of entry that are accepting Ukrainian um, uh, clients coming in. And those desks are open 12 hours a day um, via uh, a 1-800, uh, with, with on-site service in English, French, Ukrainian, and Russian. And there's also a 24-7, uh, 1-800 number that anyone can call to get further information that is being um, handed out in person at those three airports. What are we learning from the, um, the data that is being collected by the Red Cross? We know that um, the majority of those uh, coming in are between 18 and 59 years old. Approximately 20% are under 18 years of age and a, a minority of folks over the age of 60. And we know also that there are slightly more women entering Canada than men. And again, um, likely because of that mandatory requirement for males in uh, Ukraine to stay to, uh, to fight the war. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, settlement services, um, uh, our minister um, uh, announced on March the 28th that we would expand our settlement services to the Ukrainians. Normally we don't offer settlement services to visitors to Canada because we assume they're coming to visit and leave. But in this case, um, they are here on this special visitor visa and we want to ensure they have um, the services they need. So all of the services on the screen are services that they can take advantage of by um, contacting a local settlement agency in the community in which they're, they're living. Uh, in addition to that, um, um, several weeks ago, the prime minister announced 
uh, targeted charter flights to Canada for Ukrainians, so free of charge, as well as short-term income support, uh, uh, up to $500 per week for approximately six weeks. And my colleagues at um, ESDC are uh, finalizing the details on that service and also temporary hotel accommodations for up to two weeks. And my department is actually just finalizing the plans on those hotel accommodations. Obviously, we want to um, first and foremost um, provide that accommodation for individuals coming in on those charters, but it will be broader than that um, uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, and I'll now move to slide eight, please. I hope I'm doing okay on time, April. Yes, you're, you're doing okay, about five minutes, yeah. Oh, okay, I will uh, quickly get through. So just this just gives uh, you a sense that um, the Ukrainian mission is really a whole of society endeavor. And we're working closely with our colleagues in the province of Saskatchewan and other provinces and territories with settlement agencies across the country uh, and with uh, other organizations um, uh, like Danello's organization, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress has been a very important partner uh, as we have uh, worked uh, to welcome Ukrainians to Canada, along with uh, many of our other federal departments, uh, ESDC, Service Canada, uh, I said, um, Public Health Agency, CB CBSA, and many more. We'll go to the, uh, the next slide, please. We did a, a survey of about uh, 24, 24 25,000 Ukrainians who had already been approved on this visa. And this uh, is the, uh, these are the results from that survey. Um, uh, about only 200 said they were uh, absolutely planning to go to Saskatchewan. So we obviously need to do a better job at marketing the province, which is probably the best province in Canada. Um, I, I can say that I was born here. Um, uh, so this is where the, reci the, the recipients uh, or the respondents to that survey said they planned to go, obviously based on the existing diaspora. Um, and three quarters of those that re replied said they were going to be coming in the next three months. So, and 47% said they would, um, would plan to stay at least three years or even longer. 97% um, said they plan to work during their stay in Canada. So um, for employers in your communities, um, good news uh, that, um, that Ukrainians coming uh, to Canada uh, not only intend to, to stay for a long period, maybe forever, but also uh, very interested in working um, once they get here. We'll go to the next slide, please, quickly. So our colleagues, um, um, uh, both at ICED and um, uh, our national umbrella, uh, CISA AXE, have developed a portal where uh, companies or Canadians can donate either cash or uh, in-kind goods and services, uh, short-term housing, uh, and they can also volunteer. So um, we will have uh, in the chat the, uh, the links for these, um, for these websites. So you can um, certainly go on and, and uh, check out uh, how to um, socialize uh, if, if you know of companies or individuals who are interested in donating um, um, uh, financial or other assistance to Ukrainians coming to the, to the country. Next slide, please. It's just great to be uh, to be with you today because municipalities play such an important role, and um, every Ukrainian coming to Canada is going to settle in in a, in a community somewhere. Um, but in the province of Saskatchewan, you are so well organized um, uh, with with uh, the, the Suma itself. Um, we also have uh, Ahmed, who's going to be speaking to you shortly, which is our um, our provincial settlement umbrella. Seisha, who um, met, works with all of the uh, existing settlement agencies in the province of Saskatchewan. Uh, and there's also a number of other 
local immigration partnerships um, that also work with uh, communities across the province. So um, really important um, um, governance to, to manage all of the players in this whole of society lift. Go to the next slide, which is our last slide, please. And there are just some uh, links to the websites that I mentioned, um, our IRCC key figures page where you can keep up to date on how many uh, applications, how many have been approved, how many folks that are arriving uh, in the country. So um, I uh, wanna thank you very much for um, your time today and uh, I'll pass it back to you, April. Merci. Thank you very much, Corinne. A lot of really good information there. And we hope that uh, we get uh, the opportunity to welcome a lot of the Ukrainian friends coming and to our communities and municipalities. So thank you. Um, I would like now to introduce Shelley Kilbride and Doug Rain. Shelley and Doug work in the Ministry of Immigration and Career Training with the government of Saskatchewan. Shelley is the Director of Economic Immigration and has been in that role since 2019. Prior to taking on this role, Shelley led policy related research and development for a nonprofit organization and was a sessional lecturer with the University of Regina's Department of Sociology and Social Studies. Shelley has, been a, has had a keen interest in the role of immigration and population growth, economic health and Canadian culture. Doug is the Director of Programs and Partnerships and has been with the Ministry since 2007, as well as coordinating job search and career development services. Doug's team also helps coordinate settlement services for newcomers to the province. Doug is based in Saskatoon and coordinates a team of 30 staff in career service offices across the province. Please welcome Shelley and Doug. Thank you, April. Um, as April mentioned, I'm Shelley Kilbride. I'm the Director of Economic Immigration with the Ministry of Immigration and Career Training. I have the pleasure to be here today to share a bit about immigration to Saskatchewan and the government's role in immigration through the Saskatchewan Immigrant Nominee Program. Next slide, please. The Government of Saskatchewan's Growth Plan for 2020 to 2030 contains two goals related to immigration, including growing the population to 1.4 million and adding 100,000 new jobs. Saskatchewan is a place of opportunity that welcomes immigrants and our population growth in recent decades has been largely due to net international migration. From 2007 to 2021, 76% of our population growth has been due to immigration, with more than 157,000 newcomers from 184 countries arriving to just over 450 Saskatchewan communities during that time frame. This has been a very positive trend, helping to address labour shortages and revitalize many communities. Next slide. This uh, slide here is just a quick snapshot of the top destinations for immigrants to Saskatchewan between 2017 and 2021. New permanent residents to Saskatchewan arrived through both federal and provincial programs as Corinne mentioned earlier. This is just a quick look at the various immigration programs in Canada. You'll note various temporary pathways for immigrants to come to Canada to visit, work or study. And the federal government also has three permanent status streams, including the economic, family, and humanitarian streams. The Saskatchewan Immigrant Nominee Program, or the SINP, is an economic immigration program. The SINP is an immigration option for people who want to build a career and future here in Saskatchewan. Approximately seven out of 10 of the newcomers that have immigrated to the province have done so through the Saskatchewan Immigrant Nominee Program. Next slide, please. The SIMP supports Saskatchewan's labour market needs and economic growth by attracting internationally trained workers to meet ongoing labour market demand 
and attracting entrepreneur immigrants to help address business succession needs, increase job opportunities, and expand products and services. Many sectors have seen recovery from the pandemic and growth. The Ministry of Immigration and Career Training has seen a significant increase in employers' use of the SIMP to recruit workers over the past two years to address labour shortages. From 2019 to 2021, there was a 44% increase in the number of job applications submitted by employers. Currently, there are just over 3,600 employers registered and able to recruit workers internationally through the SIMP program. Next slide, please. Currently, the SIMP offers 15 distinct application streams under two umbrella categories, labor market categories and business categories. Three recently announced pathways, including the tech talent pathways and the hard to fill skills pilot fall under the labor market category of the SIMP. Our streams are dedicated to the settlement and retention of foreign workers with employment offers, entrepreneurs, international students, and those with the skills that are considered in demand in the province. There are two primary categories of the SIMP that all of the 12, um, the 15 worker or 12 worker categories fall under. These are the Saskatchewan work experience category that is used by foreign nationals who are already in Canada on a temporary work permit and our international skilled worker category, which is for international skilled workers who are typically outside of Canada. 10 of the 12 labor market categories require a skilled immigrant to have a job offer from an SIMP registered employer. The remaining two are for high skilled workers with education and work experience related to an occupation that is in demand in the province. Immigrants to Saskatchewan, and especially recent immigrants, are joining and successfully attaching to our workforce. As an example, the employment rate for new immigrants under five years in Canada, those folks under five years in Canada, ages 25 to 54 was 77 percent in Saskatchewan, compared to 70 percent nationally in 2019. The remaining three subcategories of the SIMP are for entrepreneurs and farm owners and operators. The entrepreneur and farm owner operator categories are for those who wish to live and work in Saskatchewan on a self-employed basis. SIMP entrepreneur and farm nominees invested over just over $446 million in Saskatchewan communities from 2006 to 2022. Successful candidates are selected using many factors, but the priority is their ability to generate economic growth and jobs for the province. These categories help your communities in Saskatchewan attract skilled immigrant entrepreneurs to open a new business or buy an existing one in your community. Next slide, please. The province focuses its efforts and partnerships on attracting skilled workers to the province and then retaining them here permanently. Our ability and our strength in attracting skilled workers from outside in Canada stems from the SIMP, which includes our collaboration with employers and employer organizations. But the work just doesn't end at getting the skilled immigrants here. There is work done after they arrived through settlement and integration services, with the end goal of retaining these skilled workers and their families here in the province. ICT settlement programming complements federal programming through different eligibility criteria and delivery to some different locations. Provincial services are available to other immigrant populations, such as temporary foreign workers and international students, as well as SIMP nominees. These services are made possible through relationships with community-based organizations, private sector organizations, municipalities, and other agencies. Doug Rain will share a bit more about these partnerships next. Next slide. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Please share any questions that you have in the question box. Uh, we can also provide answers to any questions that you may have uh, in follow-up. Thank you. Thanks, Shelley, and I'll take that as my cue to continue our, our provincial presentation. I don't have a slide deck this morning. I, I have a, a very short presentation. Really, my objective today is to sort of just follow up on what you've heard from Corinne and what you've heard from Shelley in terms of what do we do provincially around settlement services and supporting newcomers. As you heard um, in the introduction from April, our, our branch of career services is a, is a broad branch within the Ministry of, of ICT. We focus on career development and employment and retention, et cetera. And we really dovetail in with, with newcomer um, individuals as well and really try to work to, uh, hand in hand 
to sort of uh, accomplish multiple goals? Um, you know, is it is it easier to settle with a job or easier to get a job once you're settled? And that's the magic question that we try to uh, approach our work uh, by looking at it from, from both areas. As mentioned, we have offices across the province and we have multiple um, contracts and, and agreements with partners across the province. And that's really a key aspect to how we uh, have a good stretch of services around areas for different newcomers. I know a lot of our partners are on this call. I saw their names pop up. It's good to have them here. Um, and we work with, with, with uh, service providers across a few different areas in terms of supporting newcomers. Starting with, we're just wanting to get into some new areas of pre-arrival work. Uh, but since taking over this work from the immigration branch in 2012, the basic focus is on uh, meeting people where they're at initially, which is gateway and initial um, introductory services. So we do have partners across the province in about 13, 14 sites that really meant to do that initial engagement with newcomers and start the settlement process. And then from there, we also broaden out into providing some language programs as well as employment programs. Uh, as Shelley mentioned, we do do that in, in complement and, and sort of in uh, coordination with IRCC, try to coordinate those supports around the province so that people, whether they are be supported through federal initiatives or through provincial initiatives, our goal is to work together so that individuals don't fall through cracks and work with partners all, um, across, the, across our streams. Um, really, that is kind of the, the crux of what our, our, our branch, we're a pretty simple branch. We, we try to say that we are the career office of the province and for the public. And we, um, our end goal is around, around employment. When we get into settlement, it's really working with some of the unique needs and specialized needs of, of newcomers in different areas. I won't touch too, too much on, on unique aspects of displaced Ukrainians. I'll leave that to my colleagues who are coming up right away. Um, I do want to talk, though, is, is that we, we really try to focus on outcomes and we really try to focus on integration. So, as I mentioned, we've got service providers uh, and uh, probably around 100 service providing partners around the province that we work with. We also try to integrate as much as we can with, with other um, government areas. Certainly you've heard about you know, working with IRCC and, and with Immigration and, and Shelley's group. We also have uh, some key connections with our own internal employer services branch. Who are growing and developing and trying to bring that employer perspective. So we know with any individual um, moving along to employment uh, uh, and retention of that employment uh, can be very effective in, in accomplishing many goals for people. We know for from where we're looking at in terms of, of welcoming displaced Ukrainians, we have a bit of a step one through step uh, last kind of approach. But employment is going to be a key role to that. And you'll hear from, from my colleagues to know what I'm at and on where that those things might be landing. But really the core purpose of, of me being here today was just to give you a snapshot that we that our branch exists, that we have a network of service providers and, and supports. And it truly is a, a, a very good functional network of people around the province. And um, I don't know if, if, if uh, Suma has it, but I can post into the chat. Uh, we have a shared sort of one 833 number with immigration that, that Shelly had in her slide. And that's a number that if anybody's interested in understanding more about career services branch, can call that number um, and um, access uh, either uh, Shelly's group or our group uh, or the sasjobs.ca line in terms of getting connections there. If there's more specific things through email, you can also contact our branch through simply career services at gov.sk.ca and one of our client engagement folks will get you in the right direction. If you have questions or ways you want to help support with any newcomers are certainly responding to this current initiative with displaced Ukrainians. So that's really my message for today. And I think I'll leave it there and leave time for our other presenters. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Shelley and Doug for, for having the time to come and, and share with us today. We, we very much appreciate that. I would now like uh, to introduce Danilo Kudarak, Executive Director for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress of Saskatchewan, or the UCCS. Danilo is the son and grandson of post-World War II displaced person immigrants who arrived to Canada in the late 1940s and 1950s. Danilo was born and raised in Saskatoon, and he graduated from the University of Saskatchewan with a degree in history and Ukrainian studies. 
He later completed his certificate in teaching English as a second language, enabling him to teach English as a second language overseas. At the University of Saskatchewan Language Centre and the Saskatoon Open Door Society, Danilo's connection to his Ukrainian Canadian identity is strong. He completed his university degree with the university with the Ukrainian studies major. He studied and worked in Ukraine and for the past 19 years has served as the executive director of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress of Saskatchewan. Welcome, Danilo. Thank you very much, April. I'll just get my presentation set up here. And welcome to everybody joining us this morning. It's a pleasure for me to be able to be with you and talk a little bit about um, our organization, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress of Saskatchewan, and the role that we are playing in the um, uh, se settlement of arriving displaced Ukrainians to our province. So um, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress is a national organization that was founded in 1940, and it was founded at a time uh, of war when um, uh, Canada was uh, a um, uh, very engaged in World War II, and it was a way for the Ukrainian community to be brought together in support of Canada's um, war efforts. And uh, Following the end of the war, UCC uh, would also play an, uh, a very important role in the settlement of displaced people that were arriving, displaced Ukrainians, uh, uh, post-World War II. So UCC National is an umbrella organization, as is the Saskatchewan Provincial Council. And uh, we have provincial councils in British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and a new one being established in the Atlantic region. So Ukrainians in Saskatchewan, according to the most recent census uh, statistics, we have uh, just over 165,000, a little over 13% of Saskatchewan residents who um, claim Ukrainian Canadian identity. Most have arrived um, in the earliest waves of immigration uh, that started in the late 1890s and mostly setting across, uh, settling, excuse me, across the Parkland Belt. Um, Ukrainians are a highly visible and recognizable part of, of Saskatchewan's cultural identity. Uh, but I would like to note that um, many other Saskatchewan identities, uh, ethnicities, trace their roots to Ukraine, including many Mennonite Germans, uh, Jews, and Poles. So who are we? UCC Saskatchewan was established in 1972. It's a provincial council of the National Ukrainian Canadian Congress and serves as an umbrella for Saskatchewan's organized Ukrainian community. We have approximately 150 member organizations and seven branches in the Battlefords, the Kenora, Prince Albert, Saskatoon, Regina, Yorkton, and Weyburn. And we are a founding member of SAS Culture. Um, as well, we are celebrating our 50 years of service to Saskatchewan's Ukrainian community this year. So uh, here is our vision and mission. I would like to draw your attention, however, to our values. Um, our values of our collaboration where we respect the contributions of volunteers and with organizations and communities and um, seek to connect and support and promote those efforts where possible. Respect, we celebrate the achievements of Saskatchewan Ukrainians and honor their legacies, and we also actively promote multiculturalism, interculturalism, and diversity. Accountability. We are responsible to our members and stakeholders by being transparent, consultative, and responsive. And finally, leadership, where we strive to e evolve our Ukrainian Canadian identity in a sustainable manner by being innovative and inclusive to today's society. And I am, here we go. So our members, we have a very diverse membership in Saskatchewan, as I mentioned, approximately 150 organizations. And you can see on your right, um, a listing of some of those, including 35 Ukrainian dance groups uh, that um, uh, touch 
most, I think, of, of uh, the municipalities in the province, as well as uh, Ukrainian students' associations at the university, men's and women's organizations, the Ukrainian Co-op in Regina, etc. And the list on the left-hand side shows you uh, the, the communities where uh, member organizations currently operate. So, unfortunately, tragically, on February the 24th, 2022, Russia declared war and launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, attacking on multiple fronts. Uh, the Ukrainian armed forces and the Ukrainian people have been inflicting heavy casualties on the invading Russian army, launching counterattacks and liberating Ukrainian territory from Russian occupation. However, we are seeing a huge humanitarian crisis. Russia is committing war crimes, the shelling, bombing, rocket strikes of civilian targets. When women and men are being raped, tortured, starved, murdered. We've seen some of the war crimes in Ukrainian cities such as Irpin, Bucha, and others. And the cities of Kiev, Odessa, Lviv, Chernihiv, Sumy, Kherson, to name a few, are being attacked. The city of Mariupol, a city of a half a million people, is now completely obliterated. And historic Kharkiv, as well, has experienced significant, significant destruction due to Russian uh, bombings. And the civilian death toll now uh, is over 24,000, including. 240 children. So um, we heard, and uh, Corinne had shared numbers, that there are over 13 million Ukrainians that have been forced to flee their homes. 7.7 .7 million currently internally displaced, and 6.2 that are now in neighboring countries and looking uh, potentially to come to Saskatchewan and to Canada uh, for refuge. And this is where UCC Saskatchewan uh, is playing a role. So um, in response, we have established the Refuge Saskatchewan program to um, serve in essence as a gateway for those displaced Ukrainians coming to our province and um, ensuring that language is not a barrier and that we are able to connect them with the very um, large network of settlement providing agencies across our province. And on your screen, you can see just a list of some of the services that uh, we are able to provide through the Refuge Saskatchewan program. It was in March of this year that UCC Saskatchewan was contracted by the Ministry of Immigration and Career Training to coordinate access to settlement and community services for displaced Ukrainians. And so some of the immediate settlement needs that we are able to contribute to is register, registration for social insurance numbers, health cards, registration into the provincial um, settlement system, as well as referrals uh, for things such as language assessment um, and um, also um, to connect them with employers that are looking to hire displaced Ukrainians. Uh, I want to note that UCC Saskatchewan has been providing settlement services in Saskatchewan for over 15 years. So the Saskatchewan Gateway for Incoming Displaced Ukrainians uh, again, meets an initial needs assessments, settlement plans, language assessment, and other referrals. We have two offices. Two staff members are based out of Regina, uh, that, and uh, Luba Krupina, and Andriy Stakhov. We also have three staff working out of our Saskatoon office, Olena Atamanchuk, Oleg Harbuz, and Sadhi Korolyuk. In addition, uh, we do have a translation interpretation service. So where um, uh, those requiring documents translated or require um, interpretation are able to access qualified uh, trained uh, translators and interpreters. Um, UCC Saskatchewan uh, offers an English for employment program for those that have um, a CLB five and up. Uh, they are eligible to access uh, a 72-hour course that is content-based 
assisting them uh, to gain a better knowledge of the Canadian um, workplace, uh, to understand their roles in, in the job or in the, the, the um, labor market, uh, prepare resumes, etc. And the classes are currently delivered online and hybrid, and so they are accessible anywhere in Saskatchewan. UCC Saskatchewan also um, offers a, what's called the Communicator Program. And, and this is something that we've been contracted by IRCC to uh, provide a standardized professional development training program for community interpreters and translators. It's a 30 hour certification program and um, it it's basically serving uh, settlement agencies to ensure that the many volunteer uh, interpreters that they have, have a, a, a basic uh, understanding of their role and a knowledge of, of uh, providing uh, interpretation services. And we also um, provide information services through our website. Um, if you go to our website, we are updating on a regular basis um, information, both on the humanitarian side for Ukraine, as well as the uh, settlement, uh, resettlement uh, services that we provide and that is being provided or uh, for which displaced Ukrainians are eligible, either federally or provincially. So this is our Saskatoon office staff and our Regina office staff. And we can be contacted toll free at 888-6525850, general settlement inquiries at settlement at ucc.sk.ca. And then uh, my contact as well as Andres, my uh, <clears throat> settlement supervisor for, uh, for your attention. I would like to also acknowledge the funding that we receive uh, through the lottery system from Saskatchewan Lotteries, uh, federally from uh, IRCC, uh, Canadian Heritage, as well as very, we are very grateful for the funding support that we receive from uh, the government of Saskatchewan. And um, that's uh, my presentation for today. And I look forward to answering any questions that you may have uh, during the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Danilo. Some really good information. Um, I would like to just uh, congratulate your organization on 50 year anniversary. Thank That's you. wonderful. And I, I have to also mention that it is heartbreaking to see the news and to hear. And I believe I can speak for all Saskatchewan municipalities, but if there's anything we can do in even the smallest way, we would want to do that. Our thoughts and prayers are with Ukraine and their people every day. So thank you very much. April, if I, if I may, I, I would like to uh, <laughs> express a heartfelt thank you to, um, to everybody that, that's here today. And just um, for the, the um, incredible generosity that we are um, experiencing from the people, from the communities and the business communities of Saskatchewan, um, be it... Um, offers of, um, uh, of uh, donations, um, housing support, uh, employment for the displaced people, or even just simply people willing to volunteer and assist. It's been overwhelming, to be honest. And uh, so it is, um, you know, the, the staff have been, have been going uh, full guns since, since this all started. And um, you can imagine that the, there's days when the, the uh, emotions are quite raw because most of my staff, there are two of us uh, that are not Ukrainian born, um, but most of my staff still have parents and siblings and, and, and friends uh, in Ukraine. And so they, they have this constant stress, this constant worry about what may come uh, every day. So it, it's truly been... Um, great to have that support from to feel that support from from the province and and um and so we look forward to being able to welcome uh and provide some refuge to uh to as many ukrainians that want to come here as, as possible so thank you that's, that's great to hear and and i i think we feel a little less helpless if we can do something even small and um 
and we um, we want to do that. So thank you so much and thank to you. your organization for all that you do. Um, we're going to move on to our final presenter this morning. And our final presenter will be Ahmed Majid, Executive Director of the Saskatchewan Association of Immigrant Settlement and Integration Agencies. Ahmed is, is of Iraq descent and came to Canada with his family from Kuwait to escape the unrest during the first Gulf War in 1990. Ahmed has been volunteering and working with newcomers, newcomers for several years and is passionate about working collaboratively with other settlement organizations in Saskatchewan. We welcome Ahmed. Thank you so much, April. And good morning, everyone. I'm really very honored to be here for this important webinar alongside my, uh, my fellow panelists for what has already been a very rich and informative session. Uh, with, with really so many of the key stakeholders who have been working um, diligently day and night over weekends at times to pull together a plan uh, to welcome Ukrainians in the best possible way um, to Canada and then, and then for sure more specifically for us here in Saskatchewan. Um, as mentioned, I'm currently the Executive Director of SESHA, which is the Saskatchewan Settlement Umbrella Organization. And at SESHA, for those of you who aren't familiar, we, we don't work with newcomers, uh, newcomer clients directly but rather we work with the frontline organizations that do provide those direct services. They are essentially our clients. And while we support the Saskatchewan settlement sector in uh, many ways, and are always trying to find new ways to do more, um, at SESHA, we really try and focus in on four key areas of support. Uh, those being advocacy, uh, resource development, professional development trainings, and uh, providing networking opportunities. So when it comes to advocacy, we, we aim to ensure that we're able to uh, act on the concerns expressed by our settlement sector and, and really making sure those concerns are shared with the appropriate government channels or anyone who's relevant to uh, that issue, uh, as well as ensuring the Saskatchewan perspective is heard uh, during national conversations related to settlement and integration. When it comes to resource development, uh, we try to identify barriers for our settlement sector in terms of gaps in their programming and services and work uh, both creatively and collaboratively to develop solutions in the form of toolkits, handbooks, and uh, other resource documents. Uh, when it comes to PD trainings, um, which is really uh, based off the current needs of the sector, we, we try and work hard uh, to make sure that the frontline staff who do do the important work are equipped with appropriate knowledge and skills they need uh, to provide that best service possible to our uh, province's newcomers. And then finally, when it comes to networking opportunities, uh, we, we do this uh, in a way where we set up full sector or various uh, subsector meetings, such as employment, language, social connection working groups, uh, rural, urban, francophone specific based meetings, and really aim to provide a space and a place for uh, responses to, to current high priority initiatives, uh, such as the Saskatchewan Afghan response meeting, and now our Saskatchewan Ukraine response meeting. And with that, I wanted to talk a little bit about what our approach has been uh, to both uh, Afghanistan and now uh, Ukraine. So for Afghanistan, um, initially in, in late August of 2021, uh, we held an initial preliminary meeting with our uh, RAP providers in Saskatchewan, who would be working with the Afghans from their time of arrival at the airports throughout their initial six week period. And in those early meetings, uh, we tried to really identify what the immediate needs would be for the anticipated large scale arrival of a charter and tried to do as much pre-planning uh, as possible prior to the first landings into uh, Saskatchewan. So based on the information we received in those preliminary meetings, uh, we engaged the regional manager of Walmart who agreed to provide 300 plus welcome packages on behalf of Walmart for Afghans uh, that include basic necessity items <clears throat> such as hygiene kits, uh, healthy snacks for kids, tea bags, fruits, baby formula, diapers, um, etc. Uh, from there, we provided a free of cost to the sector trauma informed counseling training to uh, help better equip frontline staff in working with this group. Uh, we developed a permanent accommodations in Saskatchewan information sheet that highlighted various rental companies and, and detailed what each offers in terms of cost, uh, space, location. Uh, we developed a Welcome to Canada and Your New School handbook that assists newcomer children and youth, as well as their families, uh, with sort of a, a one-stop shop for everything related to the Canadian school system. Uh, and based on a concern we heard about newcomer retention and, and Afghans deciding to leave Saskatchewan after arriving here, uh, we developed a Benefits to Living in Saskatchewan pamphlet that highlights really all the wonderful things that our province has to offer, 
um, such as low unemployment rates, lower cost of living, low rental and property ownership options, uh, shorter commute times, um, et cetera. And then we did have this document translated into Dari and Pashtu and uh, printed hard copies for our settlement organizations to be able to pass on uh, to their clients. Uh, on top of this, we're always uh, playing the ongoing role of disseminating information that comes nationally and regionally to the rest of the settlement sector in Saskatchewan, as well as, uh, as mentioned, uh, hosting the reoccurring Saskatchewan Afghan response meetings. So now for Ukraine, uh, we've been trying to replicate our response, uh, while of course at the same time taking into account uh, the unique complexities for this uh, specific initiative. Uh, right from the start, uh, we've been engaged with uh, CISA AXE, which uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, is an organization that is essentially the umbrella of the umbrellas. Um, in terms of putting forth recommendations that make the most sense for Ukrainians set to arrive in Canada, as well as the settlement organizations that will be uh, serving them. Uh, there has been a strong collective push nationally to ensure we do have a strong and, and robust system in place. And there really has been a lot of appreciation for the engagement and collaborative work uh, going on behind the scenes uh, between federal and provincial governments uh, and the settlement providing organizations themselves. Uh, on top of that, we host uh, our bi-weekly Saskatchewan Ukraine response meeting uh, that includes stakeholders from the provincial government, IRCC, uh, UCC Saskatchewan, uh, the full settlement sector, including francophone and, and rural organizations, uh, municipal governments, and, and really anyone else uh, who can play a role in, in helping support. Uh, these meetings provide the, the space and the place for us to dive deep into the issues, uh, as well as keep each other informed of what is being seen on the ground. And considering for this specific initiative, there's a, a ton of planning as we go. Uh, these meetings have been really helpful and informative thus far, uh, based on the, on the feedback we've received. Uh, we've been working quite closely with the UCC Saskatchewan, uh, Danilo and his team, uh, for identifying ways we can support them in functioning as that gateway, sort of first touch point for Ukrainians arriving into Saskatchewan, uh, as well as working with them to set up a system with uh, other settlement providing organization regarding referrals and, and collaborative support. Uh, we've created and curated a list for all settlement programs in Saskatchewan and broken them down by federal and provincial funding streams as well as developed a list uh, for all Ukrainian and Russian speaking staff that are currently employed uh, within the Saskatchewan settlement sector, uh, really for everyone's knowledge. Um, not knowing what the numbers will look like in, in two months, three months from now, um, it's, it's always good to be prepared. Uh, while uh, we will be looking once again to offer a trauma-informed counseling training, free of cost to the settlement sector to once again better help equip the frontline staff, uh, as well as we're working with uh, UCC Saskatchewan to offer a Ukraine cultural information session uh, where frontline settlement staff can be more informed and equipped uh, to take into account the cultural and social considerations and nuances um, for Ukrainian culture. Uh, through a partnership with UCC Saskatchewan, we have translated <clears throat> our benefits to living in Saskatchewan document into Ukrainian uh, and printed hard copies for organizations to once again pass on to their clients. Um, and we're now looking to work with the Red Cross in providing them Saskatchewan specific information packages uh, that can highlight what Saskatchewan does have to offer at the three ports of entry uh, for Ukrainians into Canada. And I did see um, that was one of the questions that was already put forth in the chat. Um, so this is for sure on our radar and something that we're trying to actively um, engage in and work with. Um, these past few weeks, we've been working with the Saskatchewan provincial government, UCC Saskatchewan, other key settlement stakeholders and putting together a plan for what a charter flight destined to Saskatchewan would entail um, in terms of providing the basic and urgent services, uh, ensuring that the Ukrainians have a place to stay immediately upon arrival, uh, and creating a strategy to ensure the safety and security for any community hosts that will be used uh, for the housing accommodation piece. And actually our next meeting um, on this uh, subject is actually right after this webinar. Um, you heard it before already during this webinar, but I will for sure double down and say that this is a very much evolving initiative um, and we're very much eager and waiting to hear what the next round of announcements for supports will be for uh, from the federal and, and provincial governments, which will for sure help inform our steps at SESHA and, and by extension the settlement sector. I know we're getting a little bit short on time, so I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ahmed, and uh, we are grateful that your family found your way to Canada, and we appreciate all that your organization is doing and um, in helping. We are a little bit pressed for time, 
Um, but that brings us to the end of our presentations. So I'm going to get right into the Q&A and I'm hoping everybody can kind of hang on here for a little bit. Um, Doug and Shelley with the Ministry of Immigration and Career Training will also, uh, I believe, stay on and help um, answer any questions. So let's just see what we've got here. Um, first question, would it be possible to avail of the information centers at the airports to move assertively promote Saskatchewan as a great final destination? So April, maybe I'll start with that one. Um, it's a great question. And sure. actually, as we put in place those cross desks at the airports, we worked with all of the provinces and territories to um, have them uh, tell us what they wanted in the welcome package. So um, our colleagues um, uh, with the province of Saskatchewan have given us uh, a tailored input to the welcome package that, as I said, is available not only at the airports, but also uh, online. And so um, information on Saskatchewan is certainly there. Uh, and I certainly hope that uh, more and more Ukrainians will, as, uh, as uh, Shelley and Doug have said, and as Ahmad has just said, um, will choose Saskatchewan um, as uh, their, their uh, destination. Um, also, in the past uh, week or so, Canada has opened up um, a Canada Information Centre overseas in Warsaw. So this is, again, an information centre that is... Um, uh, bricks and mortar, so a, a physical uh, center uh, with information that will also be online. And um, I encourage um, my colleagues from the province to um, continue to work with us and add more and more information on the province of Saskatchewan, uh, information that, that uh, you, Doug, Doug and Shelley, think uh, will help um, encourage uh, uh, Ukrainians to choose Saskatchewan. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Corinne. Um, I'll move down to the next. Was there anybody else that wanted to comment on that? If not, I'll just move to the next. Is a local group who is wanting to accept donations to support immigrants that come to our community able to use the municipality's charitable donation registration number? Um, I'm not sure of the answer to that, April. Um, I think maybe it's more of a question for Suma. Okay. If we don't have that answer right now, um, I would ask either Stephanie or Augustina maybe to uh, just maybe look into that and maybe we can post something later. Yeah, April, we can look into that. And if we do have an answer, we can include it in the follow-up email. That would be great. Thank you, Stephanie. And our next question is just curious to know where Ukrainians get the information that help them decide which province to arrive in. Um, well, as I said, um... IRCC has both this Canada Information Centre as well as online information on our website. Um, but I see that uh, Danilo has got his camera on, so maybe he has a, a, be a better answer than I do. I, I just wanted to add to that, Corinne, to say that um, uh, from a variety of sources, um, certainly part of uh, the work that we do um, in our contract with, with the provincial government is to provide pre-arrival information. And so um, when there was a mini delegation uh, from Saskatchewan that uh, went to Berlin uh, last month, we had prepared some uh, bilingual postcards with information about contacting uh, UCC Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan uh, that were distributed there. Uh, in addition, uh, a couple weeks ago, we uh, had an, a webinar uh, targeted uh, towards um, Ukrainians that are, um, are in Europe 
which uh, provided them information about Saskatchewan and the settlement services that are uh, available here. And that is on our YouTube channel as well. So uh, we have seen um, uh, responses directly to both of those initiatives, but um, you know, they are doing their research. Um, it's a huge decision uh, for them to decide to come all the way to, to Canada. And, and uh, so, um, you know, um, they go to government websites, they go to what, whatever sources that they can get in order to get that full understanding of where it is that they're going to and the opportunities that are available to them. Great, thank you very much for that information. Uh, one more question here. Um, I think maybe that might be our last question. Are there stats or an antidotes that could speak to what factors are most important to Ukrainians or others when they make the decision about where to resettle themselves. Maybe I could just say briefly, sorry, can I jump in front yeah, of you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. May, what, um, what I could say is that one of the, um, the key determining factors for the, the early arrivals that we've seen has been, do they have a connection to the province? Do they already have family members or friends uh, that are living here and that are able to provide them with that initial support? So that's certainly a, a key determining factor. But as things uh, progress, as we see more arrivals, um, that's becoming uh, less of, because those family members are arriving, um, but we're seeing more that are coming for the, the job opportunities uh, that, uh, that uh, as well as the, the supports. So it's very important to them to have those income supports to get them through that transition period um, and the, the support of the, of the communities, be it housing or, or others. Yeah, I was just... I would, uh, oh, go ahead. I would just agree with Danilo. Um, that's exactly what we've been seeing and, and true as, as the months go by, um, uh, I think Ukrainians are deciding even though they don't have a connection necessarily to a family or friend in, in, uh, in Saskatchewan, they're, they're deciding to come anyway. And uh, so employment is very important, affordable housing is important. Uh, and um, those are the top three, um, the, the top three pulls, family, friends, employment and housing. Yeah, and I was just thinking as we were talking that, you know, so many of their supports might be in the bigger cities to begin with in Regina and Saskatoon, but once they're more comfortable and they've been there for a while, we might see them come out to smaller communities if they can find work or, or interests, I guess. So, you know, that might spread out a bit as the years go by too. April, could I just uh, actually just share a bit of information from our, our most recent stats? So um, what we know uh, that there's just almost 300 um, Ukrainian individuals that have come to Saskatchewan so far that have registered um, uh, under the program. Of those, um, we've got about 75 uh, family units that have registered with us for services. And I just want to share with you the communities that they are settling in. So um, some of our clients so far have settled in Dundurn, Elrose, Martinsville, Osler, Regina, Saskatoon, Swift Current, Wawoda, Weyburn, Ryston, Yorkton, and Warman. And we've also heard of... Uh, um, of uh, displaced Ukrainians also being in places like Humboldt and Hudson Bay and um, uh, Estevan. So that they are um, certainly um, coming to communities right across our province. Great, that's great to hear. All right, I think uh, we are past our time. I think we could talk for another couple hours. I, I certainly could with all of you. But thank you so much to the audience for the great questions. And thank you so much to the all, all of the presenters um, for joining us today and really um, some really interesting conversations. That brings us to the end of the webinar. I will pass it back to Stephanie. And thank you, Stephanie, as well for your work with the webinar. And uh, Stephanie will bring us a couple of closing reminders from SUMA. Thank you.
Thank you, April. I just wanted to say another thank you to all of our presenters for joining us today and to everyone that was in the audience attending today. We will be providing a recording of this session to all registrants within 48 hours. And remember to keep an eye on the municipal update and member emails for future webinar opportunities. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, May 31st at 10 o'clock a.m. on Scope 3 Emissions and Landfill Alternatives.